Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious with astronaut Andy Allen in the house. Hello Andy, how are you today, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you for the invite to come up and talk. Well, we appreciate it. You're a great supporter of our nonprofit, which for 20 years has been preserving the birth of the American space age and igniting the future generation of space workers. And you certainly have been involved in that space history. And as, as the CEO of Aerodyne, he is, is also inspiring that next generation of space workers. And we're gonna talk all about that because I gotta have a little introduction here. But Andy, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, what you've been doing lately uh, for the Artemis program, and and uh, then we'll do a little more intro for you here. Okay. Um, so after I was in the United Space Alliance for a little while and a few years and ran the ground ops piece of USA, then I went into Honeywell for a few years and wanted to learn a little bit about business and how business industry really works outside of aerospace a little bit. And then uh, there was a point in time that I decided I wanted to run my own company and start a company. So I kind of resurrected this company that my father had built called Aerodyne Industries, started that out. Did some odd jobs like CEO of a fire suppression company called Global Safety Labs along the way. Um, really had a good break with Jacobs and then developed mm -hmm. a good relationship with Jacobs to the point that I ended up um, for Jacobs running the program called Test and Operations Support Contract and did that for almost eight years. And then finally now I'm at the point of just trying to concentrate on uh, Aerodyne Industries and still help out where Jacobs is concerned as much as I can. Well, we're gonna talk about 25 to 30 years ago when you were yeah. an astronaut and, and he's been a, uh, an amazing manager in the upper tier of the end of the shuttle program as well as what's going on with Artemis. We'll talk to him a little bit more about that. But uh, this, uh, this special presentation of Stay Curious with astronaut Andy Allen is made possible by the Marie Louise G. West Endowment and their da her, her daughters, Laura West and Charlotte West Peaton Pole. And we are so grateful for their endowment that has allowed us to buy a very uh, fast computer to do our Stay Curious program, Andy, that was born out of the pandemic 18 months ago. And now is going strong on Facebook, Twitch, which I got a Twitch there. I'm not sure what the Twitch is, but in YouTube. And uh, we're really making our mark on all three of those social media platforms. And we can't thank our, our technical whiz, uh, Jessica Galloway. She's a Star Trekky tech uh, <laughs> celebrating the 55th anniversary of their first TV show. And of course, uh, wow. my friend and faithful producer the last 18 months, Marty Winkle. Ooh, to Marty, two Marines here in the building together. And uh, Marty worked on your engines that uh, performed so flawlessly on, on the 135 missions, those wonderful SSME engines. And, uh, the RS-25, Marty was uh, involved with that to make sure you got safe on all three trips to, to orbit up there. Uh, we want to uh, also, uh, well, we're going to take you down memory lane okay. a little bit today. And uh, twice a pilot, once a commander, his uh, space transportation system missions were 46, 62, 75, which makes me say hike because it's football season and I know you played football. Uh, but tell us, a, tell us a little bit about growing up outside of Philadelphia. Yeah, uh, a lot of my life was actually down here in Florida because my father was in the Navy. So five kids, uh, I'm the black sheep middle child. Uh, okay. So two older, two younger. And so I was the one that had all those, those, those growing issues that you have. You know, that, now I'm the oldest of four. I know about those growing issues. <laughs> so, but he was stationed down here in Sanford, Florida and in Jacksonville, Florida. But I was born in Philly and then he ended up uh, bringing us back to Philly, the Philadelphia area. We So from about fourth grade on, I was up in Philadelphia. Great time, great fun, um, good environment. Uh, I was put in a good strict environment, Catholic schools, priests, nuns. That was back in the days when they were allowed to have physical contact if you oh, so needed it. Yes, sir. Um, and I needed it a few occasions here <laughs> okay. and there. But it worked out well. They got me trained up. They set me on a good foundation. And then I got very interested in flying. My dad took all five kids up to fly. He was a CFI. 
and uh, one of them I really took to it. So I spent a lot of time going out with him on the weekends when he's teaching flight instruction. I'd just sit in the back seat and watch and listen, and every once in a while he'd trade a lesson for a flight, mm. and then he would put me up in the front seat and take me up, and um, absolutely loved it, fell in love with it. Well, while we're talking about your dad here, let's, uh, Marty, going to have you zoom in on a couple things here. Uh, here is the Aerodyne News, and they did a story on your father. And uh, there's your message as the CEO. Your father okay. was a flyboy with the Navy, part of the greatest generation of World War II. He was. He kind of looks like Rock Hudson or somebody there, or Ernest Borgnine or somebody. Yeah, he you does. Know, strapping young guy. Uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> Actually, Errol Flynn is what I'm thinking of there, kind of, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. The genes run in the family. I guess. Well, I don't know, but I think he was all at 20 in that picture and uh, joined. Zoom in a little bit on that, Marty. He joined uh, the Navy um, a few days after Pearl Harbor, still in high school, so dropped out of high school uh, to go do his part. And at that time, uh, as an underage, under 18, he had to get parents' permission of what he was going to do, so they let him enlist, but he wanted to go subs, and uh, my grandmother would not let him go submarine, so he went aviation. Uh-huh. Ended up um, on the Fanshawe Bay, got hit by a kamikaze in the South Pacific, got shot down as a torpedo wow. gunner on TBMs. And um, you know, just an amazing generation of people that we never talked about any of his uh, experiences, probably until maybe about the last 10 years or so of his life. Oh, really? Was it an inspiration to you to be a, a, a flyer? And a well, I fell in love with flying, and he always told me that the that the best technology of flying is going to be in the military. So there, once upon a time, I thought I was going to be an airline pilot, but you know, once I started really flying, I decided I just want to keep flying those things that are fast and go straight up and straight down, and it can do a lot of uh, good things. Well, that is, uh, and here's a picture of your dad. Uh, we'll have Marty zoom in on that later years there with your mother, imagine there. Uh, to set up a little bit about uh, who Andy Allen is, he's a test pilot, top gun, United States Marine Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, this is from your bio on Aerodyne. Uh, Mention about your father's involvement with that uh, Aerodyne. So he created uh, Aerodyne Industries, and actually at the time, I think he made the name up, Aerodyne, mm -hmm. uh, back in 1968. And nowadays, there's a lot of Aerodyne, so I don't know if there's a copyright there or not, but we didn't copyright it. Well, there's a Rocketdyne, of course, in there the is, 60s. There's, there's a lot of those. And he um, he had five kids and an active duty Navy officer, so he wanted to do a bunch of little odd jobs. And there's, there's times uh, when we were growing up that he'd have three separate jobs. Uh, one being a Navy officer, but the others doing things, certified flight instructor, those kinds of things to just kind of keep paying the bills, especially as we started getting ready to go to um, Catholic high schools and on to college, and he wouldn't cover all that. So he created Aerodyne Industries, kind of a one-man one, one man shop. He just kind of did his own thing. He occasionally would go into something where he would get some really good pricing on child labor, which is my brother and I. <laughs> and, okay. And then he would go ahead and um, and really uh, do a variety of different kinds of things: engineering, flight instruction, used car sales, um, logistics studies, engineering studies. He did a thing on the space station program for Randy Brinkley when Randy Brinkley was the program manager. And and so it kind of went defunct. And then um, as I was after I went out and got an MBA, and I was thinking about you know, that, that itch about could I start something up on my own? And Honeywell was getting ready to send us to uh, Phoenix. I didn't really want to go to Phoenix. I was going to get another business unit in, mm -hmm. in Honeywell, which is Honeywell took great care of us. But at the same time, I really had this itch about trying something. I, and I would probably say that I don't think there's anything more challenging or humbling than starting your own business kind of from scratch. Mm -hmm. It is. It was an eye-opener to me. I didn't think that... Uh, It'd be as challenging as it was, but it was. But now we're we're at a good point, and we've got almost 500 employees in the company, and we're growing pretty well, and, and so we're in a pretty happy place and having a good time doing it. And continuing your father's legacy, I mean, how how neat is it's that? Cool. You you couldn't you probably Andy Allen strikes me as a man that couldn't have planned his life if he wanted to because of the things you've been involved in have just uh, 
uh, any one of them. You could have retired after your astronaut career and not gone into business, I suppose. What was the motivation there? Andy? Well, I, I, yeah, I think in that sense, I've been I've been pretty blessed. I've been pretty fortunate. I think I've had uh, three careers. You know, I've had that Marine Corps fighter pilot career, that, mm -hmm. which was I could have stayed there forever, and that was just really a wonderful time and a wonderful opportunity. And and for those that really get that feeling of patriotism is just a great place to be. The opportunity to be in the space business and with NASA was too hard to resist. And then you, know, you apply to those things, you don't think you're gonna get accepted, but then you get accepted and then you go figure it out. And so a career as an astronaut I thought was pretty wonderful, bountiful. And, and what I probably appreciated more out of anything I did in the astronaut program was people. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about that later, but especially the people here at KSC. So I had a very special attraction to all of that because to me, this is where it all came to place. This is where it all came to work. And then I decided to kind of kick up a third career, which is what could I do in business and could I do anything in business that would that would work and and learn something new, learn something different. Uh, you know, one of the things my dad always did is always preached about never stop learning. So. I don't like to live in the past. I want to keep moving forward. Uh, he would always say, don't let moss grow between your toes. So we just kind of keep moving and doing things. And, and, and I have a short attention span anyhow. So this, this has all worked out well. Hmm. No, I doubt that. Well, we're talking with Andy Allen, uh, three times a pilot, uh, once a commander of a space shuttle. Uh, and this is all possible by the Marie Louise G. West Endowment that we're so grateful for here at our proud nonprofit. For 20 years, the U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation uh, has been preserving the artifacts in Space View Park just over there, a few blocks from us. We're 10 miles from Kennedy Space Center. You've been involved with our museum for a while, and, and we're so grateful for that. You took a quick little tour here with your wife Brenda's here, and we've got Ellen Brown, and uh, Katie Flakes is here uh, from uh, the, the uh, family of your KSC Aer Aerodyne family there. Pardon me? Star Trek Day. Breaks. Breaks. I said flakes. <laughs> I sorry, you, Katie. I, I They'll never you, send us another astronaut again. I I'm set so, you up for that. So sorry Yeah, he did line. set me up for I that. Did. I did. I'll take uh, the uh, blame. Well, you know, we, we do we do appreciate the uh so you're okay, you're giving me an instruction there. We gotta turn my volume down, okay? I'm getting a little excited here. Uh, all right, we'll turn my volume down a little bit, and I'll talk a little softer. We're going to talk a lot about Andy being an astronaut, but uh, business people like myself are impressed with business people like him. And in 2017, you were recognized by the National Space uh, Club of Florida with the Kurt Debus Award, which is the most prestigious award in the space industry. Uh, we have people like uh, Bob Seek, uh, launch director, and and Lee Solid uh, have have gotten that award. Uh, I think it's, I think it's like the Oscars of the business community. Uh, kudos to that. You Thank seem you. like a humble guy that Thank probably you. didn't have a long speech when you received it. I don't know what was that. What did that mean to you, Andy? Um, it was you know it's quite an honor. And and one is that it's <clears throat> a recognition with some of the folks that are there. A lot of them were mentors to me, guys like Bob Seek. I mean, um, wonderful guy, can't just say a wonderful about guy, Bob. and and um, the epitome of calm, oh. you know, in a launch countdown when you're when you're getting some times. And, and we had a couple little exciting moments here and there on some of my on um, one of my flights, and and he's just super to assimilate all the information and the way he does it. So a great mentor to a lot of people. Uh, but really, again, it, it kind of goes back to, I think, the Debus and all the folks that are here are really just just a symbol of the kind of morals and ethics and workforce that we have here at KSC. I think it's a very different culture than any place I've ever been, which is one of the reasons why when I've gone away, I've come back. Mm -hmm. It's just a, I have a great attraction for the people that are out here that everybody does work. Um, but it's a very special kind of work to be actually out there touching the flight hardware mm -hmm. and working on the flight hardware. And, and to me, it's, it's leaving, it's leaving your issues and your worries 
you know, in the right place, like at home or at the gate. So then when you come in, you do your job and you care about your job and you take personal pride in your job. And there's, there's not a lot of places in the world that, that do it the way we do it here, but everybody, everybody was part of that culture to the point that when we did have an accident and I was in charge of ground operations on, uh, when, when Columbia, uh, when we lost Columbia, you know, as much as I went through some of the grieving because I lost friends and knew the issues, but I also knew that the accident board would come in here because if it's not pilot error, it's maintenance error. And so this was the maintenance workforce. Mm -hmm. um, but I also learned in that process that that workforce almost to a person grieved as much as I was grieving for the loss that we had. And we all had to kind of get together and, and work our way through it all. So it's a very special place and it's really about the people. And, and I'll always say that because those of us that get strapped in, that's what we do. We get strapped in. You strap a rocket on and you have a very special group of people that prepare it, that take it out. My first flight when I came out here and I was looking in the aft end, a very busy place for those that don't know the aft end of an orbiter. And I was poking my head in there and there's half a dozen people in there working on the, on the main engines. And uh, it was my first flight. It was around TCDT, which is the dry countdown demonstration test. So about a month before we flew, they looked at me, kind of saw that I might be interested in what they were doing. So one of the leads, I guess, came up to me and said, you want to see what we're doing? Put your booties on, come on in, stand here. Don't touch anything. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk to you, don't talk to us. And I just, stood there probably for a good half hour or more just watching uh kind of fascinated by what they were working and how they're working and the communications back to uh, the launch control center where they were take, taking um, some tests and some measurements and at the end of it all one of the leads came up to me and said this is your first flight i said yeah it certainly is and he said well you're, you're going to be okay we're going to make sure you're going to be fine hmm. um uh, so we'll take good care of you and that kind of stuck with me forever. Wow. Um, he did make a comment after that. He said, in spite of management. So I was always very interested <laughs> in yeah. that part of his comment. So we're going to take care of you in spite of management. Yeah. Huh? So when I came back many years later, I tried to find him. I uh, never found him. But I was curious. I just struck the cure. But it, it struck me as this is a group of people and certainly one individual that um, are going to do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, to make sure that we, uh, hmm, yeah. you know, my goal in life has always been to have as many landings as takeoffs. Okay. Um, and so far, so good. Uh, but but that was just, just that care, just that attitude, just that, uh, hey, I'm on my game. We're going to do this right. We're going to make it work for you. Um, so that made a big impression on me. Well, that's a fly boy there. Have as many landings as takeoffs. But Andy, uh, you're so right, and, and you bring up something that I think all of us, when we get baby boomers or a little age on us, you had an angel that told you something, apparently. I've had people appear in my life at the beginning of a job or, or, or something to do, and I never saw them again. And you're like going, that person really helped me. Where are they? And you're just, you had that experience, yeah. and that and, and stuck with you, and uh uh, I think if you keep your eyes open, like uh, obviously a Top Gun uh, jet fighter is going to, you know, uh, you, you see these opportunities and take them. But I think that's a beautiful story. Yes, the, the NASA community, uh, this uh, old newspaper reporter here that used to develop film for a living uh, in the news business, uh, the safety awareness, the uh, just awareness of, of the of your of your surroundings is is like none other among the the nasa employees and contractor employees that i've met uh, particularly the okay. safety consciousness sure. being around a few people uh i'll have a drop a pencil in midair uh, a nasa person will tell me uh, oh your pencil's fallen you know you're like yep i'll get right to it but uh it's a great culture i i do know that most meetings at the contractor meeting like we say nasa but NASA hires all the contractors like Aerodyne and so forth to do things. They always start out with a safety tip, don't they, Andy? Yeah. Generally. Yeah, and, and it's the right thing to make sure it's not just about the safety of the crew. It's absolutely about the safety of the people that are doing the work. And, and of course, you want to 
we have mm -hmm. these um, very expensive national assets that we that we all use, and we're trying to protect those as well. So yeah, safety is safety is a big part. And to me, again, you know, the the part that really hit me was that people it's it's not just a job. I mean, the thing you you think you really want to see, even in leadership with a company, not only do you, you as the leader want to care about your people, you want to see that your people care about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you like to see passion in their work, which is never a problem here. But you also, if, even if they're doing a job they don't really want to do, they do it well, they do it right, they do it, and they do it with care, mm -hmm. the appropriate care. And in that, then we all get to come back and guys like me, it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to get strapped in sometimes in a rocket. Sam Gamar told me this. And I said, okay, Sam, well, I, not knowing Sam, I can agree. And, but the intelligence is what makes it work. All mm -hmm. the people that make it work. And what's really special is all the people that make it work. We get to go ride, we get to go up, and we get to come back, and we get to tell stories about it. Um, but the people make it all work. And Marty Winkle is one of those people working with Space Launch he Systems was. there. What, is, what I also I always like uh, reinforcing in our Stay Curious audience, Andy, is that imagine you're fired, you get your pink slip, and you've got to launch three more space shuttles, and they were flawless missions. Even the STS-135 everybody talks about was one of the cleanest flights ever. The pride that you space workers had in your, your work right down to the end, and, and nobody endangered anybody's life or compromised yeah. anything during that. Correct, Andy? I agree. And, and I'm not, I don't think I've ever seen that kind of dedication and spirit anywhere in any place I've ever been. And I've, and I've been around, um, but I've never seen it in any industry, an area of just that kind of uh, care and attention to doing what they need to do and doing it right. And, and you can talk about it, that it's a nation space program, Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's, it's people putting aside what they need to do and getting the job done. So as a team, it's just a, an awesome place to be. And, and it was a great team. And at the end, we'll get a comment in just a second there. At the end, uh, uh, Travis Thompson, who Triple T is our closeout crew lead, who you well know. He tucked you in three times in your uh, space shuttles. Uh, when Mike Leinbach had his closing meeting with all of his crew, you know, and Mike says, anybody have any questions? Uh, Triple T said, I raised my hand and says, yeah, you got someone to mow your yard <laughs> here because it was tough. Uh, and, and a lot of people didn't fall on their uh, all fours or, or on their feet after the shuttle era uh, because uh, their their jobs just didn't translate into anything out, out in the, the civilian world, did it, Andy? No, it didn't. And, and that was a really tough time. Um, I don't know how a lot of people got through it the way they did, but, you know, people adapt very well and, and they just they just keep plugging they get that attitude we're just going to mm -hmm. keep marching on we're going to do what we need to do we're going to do it right we're just going to march on but yeah the closeout crew is again another group of just really fascinating and uh, really fun people to be with you know, you're, you're getting ready to go fly you've got lots of different kinds of thoughts and feelings and mm -hmm. as you go into this uh, rocket and the only people out there are the closeout crew and the crew well, we say hi to Triple T. He's still under the weather a little bit, and uh, I don't. He won't be here Friday, I don't think, for our tales from the White Room with Triple T. But uh, uh, he wanted to be here, and he said hi to you, and uh, 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 he'll catch up with you later. So, uh, Jessica's got a comment from Charlie. Charlie Mars, our our board, our chairman of the board. Hi, Charlie. Hello, Charlie. Watching on YouTube. And he wants to know if Brenda still has the Bear Bryant football. Yes, absolutely. So she does. She says, yes, absolutely. Does uh, Andy's wife, Brenda, still have the Bear Bryant football? Bear Bryant, the legendary head coach of Alabama. I actually photographed Woody Hayes on the sideline a couple of times when I was going to Ohio State, putting myself through college, Andy. Tell us that story. On the Bear Bryant football? Yeah. Since, well, uh, the Godfather brought it up there. Hi, right, Charlie. So let's see. I think the MC was Sheriff Ivy at an auction. Oh, that'd right? been good. So we go to the auction. I think it was the first time that we were invited. And we were doing the auction. Sheriff Ivy was doing a fantastic job of the auction. This thing came up. Up to that point, we hadn't made any bids, which was good. And um, so 
we saw it came up. She got very interested in it, and she kept raising her hand. I don't know why, but she kept raising her hand. And before I know it, um, I was the proud owner of a of a of a Bear Bryant signed football. And then my only request uh, to Sheriff Ivy was that he would deliver it personally. <laughs> oh yeah, to our house. So he actually got in one of his cars and lights are blazing on the sheriff's came, car came in the neighborhood. And, <laughs> Yeah, pan over there. There's Brenda. <laughs> and uh, uh, yes, hello over there, All right? We got Ellen. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hello, good crowd here, for a little audience here today. Sorry you're not with us, Charlie. That was, that was Katie and, and Ellen and Brenda there. I don't and, know uh, exact price what we paid. Brenda said it was priceless, so apparently we got a good deal. <laughs> Bear Bryant, of course, known for his hound's tooth ball cap, uh, uh, and I spent 35 years in East Tennessee, so I've I uh, sometimes bleed orange down there. But you're University of Florida, correct? Is that so where you I got, got my, your MBA? My uh, MBA at Florida, uh, which you didn't have to, and that's uh, that's what it, uh, is so <laughs> I love about Andy Allen is he didn't have to do that. You you had a good career already, I but I did, I but. Did. Uh, but you went back to school so you could learn more to be the businessman you are today. Yeah, I, I had interest in something I didn't know about. I, you know, I, I thought I'd, you know, I've done the things that I had done with the Marine Corps and with the NASA. And you know, there's this little thing about the, the business world I thought I wanted to learn. So I figured that was a good way to do it. Yeah, I went to uh, my bachelor's in a little school up in Pennsylvania called Villanova. So that's where I got Villanova, that's right. A basketball school. A now, basketball how big is the statue they erected to you there at Villanova? I think I have a little corner of a little um, showcase, and it's an 8 by 10 Okay. But I did fly a, a, a banner for them. You're allowed to fly certain things on your flight, so mm -hmm. I did fly a little I don't know what their nickname is. Wildcats. Oh, the Wildcats. Okay, like the Arizona Wildcats. Uh, Villanova, get with it, man. You need to have some <laughs> something about this great man at your university. Yes, uh, Jessica, another comment. Hey, Uncle Andy. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. Max Scott. Robert, Robert McGregor. Hello, Robert McGregor. All right. And we know Robert Law is watching in Dundee, Scotland. and, and D, uh, So <laughs> you... Hope you're enjoying your cocktail there, Robert, and I'm sure he's watching on his big screen TV. Robert and Dave have been converted. Uh, Dave Stang's up in Macomb, Michigan, and uh, Christopher Mix in Hudson, Wisconsin, and we've got Dean Salswittle is enjoying his breakfast in New Zealand right wow. now, Andy. Okay. Okay. They, are, they are great supporters of our museum. Hazel Banks, I know you're not missing this. Watch it to the end, Hazel. we got a surprise for you. Yes, Jesse. Oh, yeah, we're going to... Uh, gee... Talking all this time and nothing about him being in space, but we're going to solve that right now and throw some pictures of this uh, Andy Allen, uh, twice a pilot, STS-46 and, and uh, 62, you were a pilot. Let's look at that first crew there as we do our magic here uh, that we're so, so uh, grateful, Andy, that we're doing this this way. Marty and I uh, really, uh, well, we did it old school way there, but... Your mission here was um, uh, eight days in space, which was your, your shortest mission in space uh, right. by, by a lot, actually, four or five days. It was in July to August, uh, end of, July 31st to August 8th, 1992. Wow, 29 years ago. And uh, this was the 150th human space flight to orbit the Earth. I don't know if that stuck with you, but you were a rookie with... Uh, an Italian astronaut. Uh, uh, no, you, had, you had the Swiss Claude uh, Nicola, uh, Nicolier. Nicolier. Claude Nicolier. Nicolier. He just had a birthday uh, last week because mm -hmm. we celebrate y'all's birthdays. That was his first of four flights. And uh, Franco uh, Malerba. Malerba was a rookie. That was his one of one. And um, you were a first time pilot with, uh, I think he's an awesome man, Lauren Shriver, his third and last mission there. Uh, so let's look at some of that flight where you were involved with the the tethered satellite system. And we're going to see a picture or two of that here. Let's go tethered satellite system. There's the tethered satellite system. A little fun picture. Uh, Jessica's got another question. Robert wants to know what your favorite shuttle mission was that you went on. And now that we got pictures, you'll probably be able to point it out. But 
I want to make sure you had that in mind to answer. Okay. It's easy. It's easy. When I was a commander. When you're the commander. The 75. And then uh, Kelly, Kate's uh, sister, uh, wants to know what, uh, since you were a Top Gun pilot before you became an astronaut, what was your call sign? Ooh. <laughs> Embarrassment? Do we say No, it? no. That, no? But there's a caveat that goes along with call yeah. signs, story, right? Story time. <laughs> story time. So um, call signs, especially in the Navy and the Marine Corps, are given to all the pilots. So we don't go by our real names. We go by our call signs. And they are, they are not... Um, they are not requested. Uh, you don't request your call sign. You can't. And if you do, you'll get a call sign that might be the antithesis of anything <laughs> you ever wanted it to be. Give you the um, exactly. Or, and you can't have your girlfriend or your spouse come up and ask anybody about what your call sign is going to be. So generally it happens generally late on a Friday evening, usually sometime after happy hour is getting ready to close. Yeah. And everybody <laughs> and everybody's been well nourished as they think about yes. you and what they They're, and some call signs are very simple they can be part of a name um but there's some thought put into it all uh, but whether you like it or not it doesn't matter because you're going to live with it so yeah. um my call sign was slick slick s-l-i-c-k okay slick slick all right it all worked out very, very well. All Good question. Thank you. I, I, I wouldn't have the nerve to ask that, I don't think, because I know some of those call signs aren't for public airing. A no, they're not. There's some that in are, there that, that stay within your headpiece. There's some that there. many that aren't politically correct anymore. Well, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, okay, yes. That was good. Uh, Matthew, you too. Matthew. When Matthew who? Matthew Allen. Matthew when Allen? When will I be getting my wages for all of my child labor? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We what, got the Allen family on yeah. board. We love it. Uh, what child labor spoiled number four? <laughs> He's the fourth kid, but he was the most spoiled. So they, I, they all what child labor, right? It's part of the deal. So did he ever yes. do child labor, Brendan? I don't know if Matthew ever did you any child You can legally employ your It's a tax credit. <clears throat> Okay. Well, you know we're here at the Space Museum. But we can't wait to see him. He's he's in his freshman year at Baylor, and hopefully he'll do well. And he wants to be an engineer. So good. Um, we'll see how we'll see how his future. Maybe so. Yeah, yeah. We encourage. I encourage a lot. I was a liberal arts kid, you know, in the in the 70s, and I encourage the people to go into engineering if you want to have a well-paid job. Because though I loved my newspaper uh, career and working for the Associated Press and all. Uh, yeah, it was the top <laughs> tier that uh, the managers like you were the ones that that uh, yeah you spend more money the most on most in there. Your son, Matthew, your brother. My brother Matthew. Oh. Okay, well I do have a brother named Matthew Allen. He he puts out a lot of his own YouTube videos and stuff because um, he's an entertainer as a spare job. All right. Tell to uh, to like and subscribe to us. <laughs> Right. Little shameless self promotion there. Um, my older brother Matthew, who tried to kill me numerous times as we were. <laughs> he did. Okay. Uh, well, all right. We got the. Uh, we love the family interplay here, and we're we're loving uh, getting off the earth here with Andy Allen. Those of you joining us, we've got astronaut Andy Allen here we're talking about his first space mission. Being a rookie, was it really like being the the the, the low end of the short end of the stick or whatever? Uh, uh, and here here's your mission. We want to talk about your mission there. Okay. That this was tethered how satellite. big this tethered satellite system was. And uh, Andy, explain what the, though you were the pilot, so you weren't the scientist involved, and that's why the <clears throat> Europeans were on there. Uh, explain what that was about to our stay curious listeners. So I call this flight, and again, I put it in simple terms because that's the Marine in me. So if a Marine can understand it, then most anybody should be able to. But it's um, it's kind of the Benjamin Franklin of, of space. No, I never thought it that the way. Earth. The key on the kite thing. The key on the kite. So you so you put the satellite out at 12 miles, and, and the string that you put it out on is a conducting string, kind of like a telephone wire, not much thicker than a, the old days of a telephone wire. Some people don't. Mm -hmm. Remember that because they don't right. have telephones like that anymore. But at about the size of a cable. Yeah. So <clears throat> your charging cable for your like phone. Like a charging cable, maybe so, a little bit bigger than that, but um, but not by much. 
and it goes out 12 miles and it creates this big electrical circuit in the low Earth orbit in the Earth's magnetic field. So you create this big circuit that can go up to 5,000 volts and maybe, um, maybe a few amps. So you can create electricity, but you also have a, um, an orbital mechanics, uh, motive, automotive force kind of a, kind of a phenomenon happening at the same time that if you were to cut the cord, one, one part of you would get a boost into orbit, the other part would get a deorbit. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it was, it was all about Earth's magnetic field and studying Earth's magnetic field. This is the first flight. And on the first flight, the tether reel jammed. I don't even think we were out 100 feet. So it jammed pretty close to the vehicle. We spent a lot of time trying to unjam it, but it jammed. So we came back, brought it home. They fixed it, and then we flew it again uh, a few years later, four years later. Mm-hmm. STS-75, STS and you commanded that mission. I commanded that flight. It was, you know, once we didn't get it right the first time, four out of the seven of us flew the same flight again. So and they were putting this out on a tether... There you are inspecting it. Uh, that's that's Andy in the blue bunny suit standing up there. Uh, and you already told us earlier you like being hands on and down among the workers. And I do. And uh, uh, there's a picture of that. Uh, and I think this is uh, there's you in the pilot seat. Yeah, that's of, uh, uh, getting that'd ready. Be Atlantis, correct? No, yeah, yeah Atlantis. That's and then, in Atlantis. Okay. So I'm in the right seat of Atlantis there. Uh, taking some photos, uh, doing Earth observation. You know, we go up and down in our uh, orange pumpkin suits, but uh, you know, on orbit, it's a pretty comfortable environment of shorts and and uh, shirts. Totally you go out shirts. there and you go out there and see see the old girl out there at the visitors complex once in a while. I do, and uh, what a fantastic job they've done out there. At the that complex. reveal yeah. of it is just uh, I, I cry every time I see it. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty phenomenal. That you, you're you're in a, a a room and they show you videos of the shuttle launching and and then it comes in for the last flight and they go well to the the, the sh you know welcome yeah. home yeah. Atlantis and they open up the doors that you're seeing the movie on and there it is and. I've seen it about 20 times, and each time I just... I think it's a pretty powerful sight. It, it really it is. It just is testament to what I think is really the greatest yeah. invention of the 20th century, that thing. The greatest invention of the 20th century, you think, huh? Yeah, well, it's... Uh, Up there with the... Uh, you know what... Um, um, starts out as a rocket, turns into a spaceship, comes back as the world's worst glider. It yeah. Worked. Right. And, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the astronaut that uh, was on the Mir space station, Marty... Um, um, John, he said that he thinks there'll be a hundred years before we build another space plane like Blaha. that. Pardon me? Blaha. Yeah, Bla John Blaha does an awesome talk uh, out at this visitor's complex, heard him a couple times. And he says it'll be a century before we build something like this yeah. again. So. And, and, and you know, the Russians tried. didn't work out so well for them. But So this is the ingenuity of the real intelligence that we have on making there, stuff happen. There it is up in space. It, it jammed up. There was a, a kind of a, a, a somebody didn't do something right to what I read that, that jammed up or they hadn't thought through a mechanism or something. But this was going to tether out 26 miles, something like that? Uh, 12 miles. Oh, I'm sorry. 12 miles. And uh, you, you flew it again, and I know you had, we'll talk about that in a minute, but while I'm thinking about it, to my knowledge, we've not done any of this technology off the space station, have we? No. Not and is there I, a reason for that? that? I know you're not the scientist, you're the, the, the flyer, but... Well, part of the experiment that we did on this flight was to build a, a technology opportunity to do it on a space station. Because if you can lower something down and then eventually let it go, that might do a deorbit burn, and then it might give the space station a little bit of a boost. So the orbital mechanics were studied a lot on this, mm -hmm. but it was really about the... Um, electromagnetic field that and the that really got everybody's attention on it so i think it's still out there as a theory it, the very complex mission to me the smartest people in the world that i've ever known you know jeff hoffman and franklin chang diaz and claude nicoye the mission specialists that were on this flight mm -hmm. they were the ones that really had to understand how all this was was going to work and what they were really studying and, and plasma physics and all the kinds of things that that really brought it all together so I think it's still a, a, a technology that should be looked at. And I think it's a technology, even the mission that we did do on 75, 
Bill rewrote a lot of the history books or a lot of the science books on on the kinds of things that we learned that we didn't know before. You know, it's something as simple that people think we've got it figured out of what happens with the Earth's magnetic field in low Earth orbit. We really didn't. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot to learn about that. Marty, I'm going to have you zoom in here before we get uh, Andy off ground on, on STS-46 in uh, July 31st, 1992. I want you to zoom in on, we love showing the launch passes that people had out to Space Center, and that got that would have got you uh, on the causeway uh, there, and there's a press site uh, pass there. And then what I have below here... Uh, Andy's got a picture there, uh, getting suited up, and you've got a note. Uh, it's hard to see. You got a note to your two daughters there. That's a lot uh, of the Jessica and Meredith. Yep. So twenty nine years ago. Twenty nine. So years how many ago. grandchildren have they brought you now? Four. Four. <laughs> okay. And, All right. And so we had. Uh, we've got. We've got four children. So we had the girls at the time, and now the boys are weren't part of all of this, but they they've learned all about it from growing up in the in the family. So tell a little bit about what NASA did for the families on launch day. We've not talked about that briefly. Okay. The uh, uh, here here's the passes we showed that Marty would give to uh, he would take this pass or give it to one of his family members to go out there and watch the launch. Uh, tell us about the procedure for the families, sir. Well, I'll do it in a couple of different thoughts. Um, one is you have uh, what you call the uh, friends and some family we call the non-extended family and I've come from a pretty large family so those folks will get causeway passes mm -hmm. causeway might be what six miles away five miles away depending on where you're on the causeway mm -hmm. and and that's a vehicle pass and so however many people you can fit in that vehicle can come on site and watch from the causeway <clears throat> then there's a there's a group we call the extended family so NASA will allow you to have one bus you know, one of the old KSC buses, the double-decker buses, mm -hmm. will allow you to have one bus to bring up your family. I think it was limited to 55 people at the time, your extended family. So that's your brothers and sisters and and parents and aunts and uncles, cousins that you knew and cousins that you didn't know you knew that all come up, you know, to want to get an extended <laughs> right, family yeah. pass. So they get the extended family pass. They get to go out to the Banana Creek viewing site, which is a great place to be where the Saturn V facility is now. And and then you have your immediate family. Um, and the immediate family is, is really your spouse and, and your kids. And they'll go out to Launch Control Center. And the kids will be kept busy by going into a room with markers and a whiteboard and just creating art mm. on the whiteboard. So on my first slide, you can see just hand imprints of my, my oh. daughters because they weren't going to do much else than that on the first flight and just put their names down. But there's a lot of artistic stuff that's in there. And NASA has put those and cased those, and they're in the, um, really? they're in the Mission Control Center, I mean the um, Launch Control Center. So they're in the LCC, and you can walk the halls basically on the third floor on the fourth and you can just see the walls are all covered uh, with all these family pictures some some have some art talent in the family some don't <laughs> um, but it's but even now all three of my flights are on a wall um, that I probably looked at six months ago and and looked at the names and looked at the oh neat and, and it's kind of neat to do that and so what they'll do is they'll do that and they'll be well taken care of. They'll be sitting in one of the senior <clears throat> director's rooms uh, over there at LCC. And right around uh, coming out of the nine-minute hold, which is about 20 minutes before the flight, um, where, as you're in the nine-minute hold, so about ready to come out of the nine-minute hold, which takes you all the way to, to launch. They'll take them all up on the, on the roof of the uh, launch control center, and that's where you're your spouse and kids will come from. And then there'll be a, a number of astronaut escorts around, especially with the, with the, uh, with the family right there. And, and that, in case anything goes wrong, they'll just make sure that everybody gets the mm -hmm. right things and, and gets the right support. And so they do a great job of, of taking care of the families. A lot of good food, probably. The Thank Launch Control Center is 
that's this that's the lower building beside the big bab that's where marty had uh he was at one of the launch controls there c12 marty C12, and, and i'll just C12. add in one more piece for yeah. for the uh, one other thing that they do is at l minus two they offered us a a picnic out at the beach house so there's there's a thing out there we called the beach house mm -hmm. at the time it was a little red shack that was up there on the beach not too far from the titan pads but that's where we would go kind of decompress but l minus two we'd come out we'd have a barbecue and you could bring out five guests so yeah, i in my case i brought out my siblings uh, and my father at the time my mother had passed and we would, we would have a mass on the beach uh, we had uh, a good barbecue got to spend some time visiting each other and then that was the last we saw of them before, until we came back after the flight. All right. Quarantine for health reasons, too, and right. so forth. Quarantine. Comment and question, Jessica. Um, somebody said, hi, Dad. And I'm, I'm, you said your daughter was <laughs> yeah. Meredith? So I've got, I've got... an M in the username. Okay. Well, so I, I have two M's. That. I have two M's and two J's. There's Jessica, Meredith, John, and Matthew. So the M was the M was probably Meredith. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll send you the link there. If I was uh, the guest. We'll send you the link <laughs> of this. But... Right, We're... And then Susan mm. Giles. Mm -hmm. Hey Andy, do you remember your support as a Talcom in Banjul? Great to see you again from Dean Schaff Banjul G O M. Okay, the ground operations yeah. manager. I know Hi, Dean. Hi Dean. Yep. So Good Dean to see today. Good to hear from you all. Yeah, so before every flight, you send people overseas uh, to a couple bases in Spain, and there's a couple bases in Africa. Mar Monaco, I mean Morocco, Morocco. Hard, ben, hard to right. be said to Morocco. Ben Gurir in Morocco, and Banjul, Gambia. And then uh, Moron in Zaragoza, Spain. Banjul, Gambia um, has a monument, if you ac actually go out into the town a little bit, and the monument is to Kunta Kinte. Oh, really? The, um, the famous root. So that's uh, the village that Kunta Kinte that right? out there in Gambia. That's the village. Yeah, I've heard Kinte some stories is. from Bob Seek about that Banjul. Yeah. It got a little, it, it got taken off the, the map, I understand. It did. It was uh, a good place. It was uh, uh, in there. But uh, I think uh, we've determined it is Meredith. Uh, <laughs> and, Dean. Uh, my husband, Troy, uh, says the beach house is still there and he drove by it all the time when he worked on Cape. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dean, for that. Dean's been uh, that a Stay Curious program about the transoceanic abort landing sites right. where they had a whole, you'd be an astronaut, go over there, support a whole, like, 30 people go over there. Mm -hmm. They had a net, all right, to catch the shuttle down these long runways. Uh, about two minutes was, was the window that you had to be looking mm -hmm. to work over there, and after three minutes passed, you'd you folded your tent up, and, and but a necessary part of the program right. because if one or the engines went out, you would have to land somewhere right. overseas. And, right. and uh, com comment a little about that. People don't realize that. So uh, couple, that that first three minutes was really yeah. So the, while you're when you're in the first couple minutes, you have uh, these abort scenarios. One, if you if you lose an engine within the first, I can't remember exactly, maybe a minute and a half, you wouldn't have enough velocity to go anywhere. So you do a return to launch site. I'm glad you never tried that. I'm sure. No, on my third flight, we we were we weren't considering it. We thought we had indications that were going to drive us into this thing called RTLS return to launch site because we had some. Uh, no offense to Marty, but we had a couple engine indications that said we had an unhealthy engine on liftoff on my last flight. <clears throat> and once you get past a certain velocity, now you don't have enough velocity to get into orbit, but you have enough velocity to go overseas and land overseas in about 30 minutes after launch. And that's where you do the Spain and that's where you do the, the Africa depend on your, your launch trajectory. And then, mm -hmm. and then you would go ahead and have people over there like astronauts and, and crews of people that would be able to take care of the vehicle when the vehicle got there. But from a crew perspective, we'd be flying basically uh, embassy airplanes, King Airs, uh, C-44s uh, is what the Air Force would call them. And the first time I went over there, we didn't know that we could get them to do a 17 degree dive like the, like the orbiter would do. But wow. we figured out how to get the speed brakes out, how to put the gear down and 
they let me up in the in the front seat and we figured out how we were going to do these 17 degree dives so we could take the weather and call back and and tell them that the weather was okay or not okay hmm. so we did real weather uh, discussions back to uh, mission control another comment we're glad everybody's enjoying stay curious with astronaut andy allen <laughs> so, right. you invited, so you invited my whole family to yeah. this thing great <laughs> great you might be here Right. We might be here another four or five hours. We might know. be. Uh, the uh, 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 well, uh, I got two questions that come to mind. I keep jumping Was it around. Just here. a hello from Lee. Okay, hi back. Your first mission that we're on, uh, you had a personal preference kit that the astronauts put their goodies in, their wedding rings and things for family to take up. But uh, you appear to have a lot of women in your family, and uh, you and I with. Uh, Chuck Jeffrey, our collections analyst, had dinner one time, and you told a neat story about what uh, uh, Commander Shriver told you to do to get more uh, jewelry in space. Well, so I'll uh, I'll disavow any uh, input from <laughs> from Lauren Shriver giving me, but plenty of the other astronauts also okay. talked to me about a technique. Um, so again, I had a very large group of, of people in my family and you have a an official flight kit which you can take 10 items like school banners and things and then you have a personal preference kit called PPK and the PPK was basically an 8 by 10 piece of paper folded in half that had two inches of thickness to it. So not very big but it had to fit in that confines. You had to be able to put it in the bag. So there's a couple things that happened on that flight. One of the things I wanted to fly on that flight was, was a cross. And the cross was off my mother's coffin who had passed just prior to the flight. Mm. So it was, it was a difficult time for me. And we figured that one, she was going to get a better seat, but two, hmm. that I wanted to be able to carry something. So I wanted to carry the cross, but the cross stuck outside the, the bag that was longer than the dimensions of the bag, so mm -hmm. NASA wouldn't approve it. Mm. So Lauren, uh, being the great commander that he was, went to bat and a lot of other folks to try to get this formal approval by NASA that I could fly this cross in my PPK, which it was almost an act of Congress to get an, an okay from the mm. bureaucracy of NASA. Some of the Apollo guys probably spoiled it for us space shuttle guys on how much stuff, as we would call it, that we could take up. So one of the things I guess I learned is other than the number of items, because they all had to be uh, packed separately than other things that they would pack, and they all had to be packed officially, and they all had to have an official list that got approved up at NASA headquarters. Um, someone somewhere along the line uh, told me that, you know, once you come out of your room in the morning to get dressed, uh, to get suited up, when you come out of your room, you're going to have your, when I flew, uh, we, we would wear diapers just like the women wore diapers. They're the first one to wear the diapers. And the guys finally figured out that was more comfortable than what they were making the guys wear. Okay. And um, so we would go wear the diapers and, and as you waddled and squeaked down the hall, but you had your, your long johns on. But from that moment on, you were basically on camera. Mm -hmm. So anything you, you didn't want anybody to see, you pretty much had to tape to your skin underneath your diapers or underneath your um, your, your uh, long johns. And so I had too many items. So there's a few items that I that I managed to to sneak aboard. I guess no yeah. metal detector in the white room. Up and there's there no to, metal detector, yeah. and I didn't lose anything. And and I haven't told which people. Exactly which items were <laughs> in the diapers <laughs> versus were in the PPK, uh, just in case anybody cared one way or the other. Yeah. That's a great story there. Well, from their personal reasons, you're wearing a ring uh, that was in his diaper. But or? it's also something that's not easy because as you go through G's and as you get <clears> strapped in, you don't want things in a bad place that are going to be uncomfortable for you. So there's techniques involved in, in how you tape these things up and the locations. So I won't get any more past that. It's too graphic. That was a lot of information. This is still a Thank you. Yeah, show. That, uh, that is. And uh, your family's <laughs> horrified now to hear all of that in there. Well, let's get on with a couple of his missions here. We're enjoying a conversation with astronaut Andy Allen, taking him down memory lane. 
probably hadn't thought of these things in a few 24 hours. Uh, no, I haven't. So uh, I that's what we're all about is to, uh, we love our astronauts, the 350 so American astronauts that uh, have done the, uh, so many great things for our society and are doing great things on the space station right now to improve our lives. And, and you are one of them. Uh, let's show this one. I don't know if this is the, you had some fun there taking pictures. Uh, there's Lauren Shriver on the right. Uh, and this was the string. Uh, tell us about uh, these gag pictures that you astronauts like doing. Well, we always try to do at least one gag picture when we had all the formal picture day of picture taken it's a full day actually when we go do our pictures and it's done in houston correct and of it's course. done in houston at the studio there in houston so we try to have a little fun the one thing about the tethered satellite being 12 miles of string uh, of conducting cord is what would happen if it broke we trained people promised us it would never break but we trained what would happen because you'd have this big recoil up in space and not only would part of it be going away from you, there'd be a whole bunch of that cord and string that'd be coming at you. Mm -hmm. And so from a commander's perspective, which I had on my, which Lauren had on this flight as a concern, but I got on the third flight, my third flight, was you can't have 12 miles of tether wrapped around your orbiter either. And the tiles particularly. Well, that could be a bad day trying to close payload bay doors. Oh, wow. Hand. So we paid a lot of attention to it, but we decided to make a gag of the, 12 miles of string catching us all up. And, um, you know, again, after, after a full day of, of taking pictures, you're ready for some kind of levity. Marsha Ivins is getting into it there. And uh, I think Claude's got the best pose. I like Claude. I like Claude's the best. And then he's, uh, he's right behind you there. <laughs> Claude is uh, to the oh, uh, far left, right beside Marsha. Marcia. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, let's move on here. Oh, wait a second. Oh, there's a little... <laughs> that is... Got a little bit of tether here, Andy. No, I... Courtesy... Uh, I'll, I'll be stuck to that flight forever. You will be stuck to that flight forever. I'll be stuck to the string forever here. All right. We'll move on here. There's a tethered flight. Uh, there's the beautiful bird at night. Um you know, you're an astronaut. You can go all over the place, get in the car, go out there. I couldn't resist probably going out there once in a while and meditating and thinking about this beautiful national resource, like you said. Um, so that view, I did that every flight. That was a, That's a very powerful view when they have the rotating service structure pulled back. And you go out there, especially when they have the xenons on, and... And you see those xenons and it's lit up like nothing you've ever seen before. And it's just this beautiful picture. And at the same time, I would park there on the, on the crawler way, almost in that same exact spot where you would take that picture and just wow. look at this vehicle. Cause you, especially after they fueled it, like L minus one, you can start to see it venting. And sometimes if the wind was there, it's only being held down by the four posts on the bottom. So you could actually see it rock a little bit. And of course we would feel it rock it once we got inside. Mm -hmm. But it just looked like this uh, miracle that was about ready to happen in your life and, and such a significant event. But it was such a beautiful sight of all the people that had to come together that make this thing work. So the million of man hours that the workforce had to do here at Kennedy Space Center to make this work. And that's about how many labor hours we put on those vehicles mm -hmm. in between mm -hmm. flights the amount of training that we had to make sure that we didn't, uh, I mean, the worst thing you can do is embarrass yourself on CNN. <laughs> so we didn't want to do any of that. So we trained really hard. And then, and the two ways not to fly after you've been in the flying business with NASA for a while, one of them is to embarrass NASA and the other one's not pass the flight physical. So you can keep passing the flight physical and don't embarrass NASA. Don't embarrass NASA you could probably keep flying. Mm -hmm. But uh, I loved it. And especially in the evening, sunrise sunset and late at night with the xenons on it it was just such a picturesque a very unforgettable sight to me it was just as much an unforgettable sight as looking down on the earth from space well pictures never do it justice right did you carry a camera around with you when you did that or i didn't that, I, don't, I, don't, I don't i don't i don't i don't hear too many astronauts did you had too many other things to carry around to remember i you suppose did. in there 
Uh, here's your second flight, okay, uh, which was in March of 94. Again, you had a, like a 9 a.m. launch on 46. Uh, on 62, it was uh, 8.59 a.m., and you spent two weeks in space. You went from eight days to two weeks. Now, again, they're in the cabin. They're in the, 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 the of course, the cockpit and then the, the lower bay, the mid-deck. Uh, and uh, mm. this mission was, again, with Marsha Ivins. Uh, second time you've been in space with her. And uh, Sam Gamar, your birthday mate. Both of you were born August 4th. And uh, along with Mike McCulley, your uh, senior astronaut friend in there. Uh, comment about you three astronauts sharing uh, August 4th is your birthday. So Sam and I were actually born the same year. Mike was born uh, quite a number of years ahead of us, but we, yes. were, we were kind of born on the same year. Yeah, he's, uh, he's our big brother. He is. Um, and some of the gifts that they got when, when that line was being formed of who gets what, you know, as you're getting ready to be born, uh, <laughs> Sam got the gift of knowing every joke in the world. Oh, really? On jokes, he could he could recite. So when we're on the pad, and you, you you get strapped in about three and a half hours before we launch, we were between Sam and Pierre. We were three hours of nonstop telling jokes. Wow! Um, that they all knew everything there is to know. Um, Mike Mike got the gift of of the gab and and building relationships really fast. He just had a great way of of um, getting rapport with people in a very rapid way. So, but he was dad to us, or at least big brother. To us. But I think Sam's actually a, a few hours older than I am. Few hours I'm the youngest of the August. Leo's, we had a whole show about, uh, uh, you can't believe the number of astronauts born in like two weeks of August is like 18 of you. Right. Uh, well, uh, there must have been cakes just a flowing out of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, you did. And, uh, and um, and then Mike McCulley's actually a, a cousin-in-law of mine. Is that right? So I, so I okay. teased. Uh, so Brenda and uh, and I and, and Mike were at an event, and they started talking. And as they start telling stories, Brenda's mother's side of the family was all from Tennessee. Mike's side of the family was all from Tennessee. And before they knew it, they figured out that they had some cousin relationship there. And and uh, so, yeah, so he's a little bit of a distant cousin of mine. Yeah, Mike, born in San Diego, but I think Franklin, Tennessee, is his adopted yeah. home. Yeah. And uh, Sam was born in, in some place called Yankton, North Dakota. No wonder he's got a great sense of humor. <laughs> and he does. <laughs> in there. Uh, so we're enjoying this with Andy Allen. This mission was a microgravity experiment. You were doing all kinds of things uh, and a lot of biomedical experiments. Uh, there was a payload thing uh, in, the, in the, the cargo bay. But what I find very interesting is you as a pilot took Columbia to the lowest altitude the spacecraft has flown at 105 miles. Usually you're flowing at 200 and 250 miles, correct? Exactly. So tell us why you did that and kind of was that a challenge uh, for you as a pilot? And here's the beautiful picture of the ionization is what you're trying to figure out on the, yep. the surfaces, correct? So when you look up at night, uh, you can see the space station, even though it's 300 and some miles up, you can see the space station, you know, coming across the sky at night. So when we're bright like this, because that ion, because we're lower in the atmosphere, uh, we're going to pick up a lot of that, that ionization, as you called it, as we go streaking across the sky. And we went down the 150 miles really for more than anything else. Uh, one, to do a test flight to see about how the vehicle reacted in that altitude. But at the same time, we also used it to take some IMAX footage. So there's a IMAX film called um, Blue Planet. Mm -hmm. And there's some low altitude flying, I would call low level flying that we did. And so I was the uh, our photographer for the the 70 millimeter IMAX. Oh, were you? Okay. So I'm taking pictures from that altitude uh, going across Jakarta and Indonesia. Yeah. And, and they show up in the in the Blue Planet movie, which is really very good. You're cool. a film cinematographer. I was. Now, was that been a, was, the, was the bird flying upside down and you're looking out the, the roof windows of the cabin? or? So we're actually uh, flying backwards. Okay. In that picture. And, so, and uh, tail to the velocity yeah, vector. Right, you're looking out the, the windows right. into the cargo hold. <clears throat> IMAX was out those windows, or were they the... We had, we had a manually held IMAX, 
And then we also had an IMAX in the payload bay, which uh -huh. was looking outside the payload yeah, bay. Blue Planet's gorgeous. Everyone's yeah, seen Blue Planet movie. on there. Yeah. So, well, uh, did you maybe take that photo, or is that Marsha took that? Marsha took that photo. Yeah. All right, and she had uh, six flights. She's uh, there's the crew up at the very top. Uh, my knees would be shaking, but you see it there on the top of the the remote service structure, and uh, the. Uh, that's on 75. That's a, that. Oh, that is the start of 75 there. Yep. We got you. Yep. Your commander of 75 the here. Yeah. There's your crew again. That was uh, rolling out to the uh, pad. What a gorgeous shot in the twilight uh, there. It's uh, not quite up to the pad. The, uh, um, the crawlers crawl underneath. Yeah. Crawlers right behind you there bringing it up. There you are in the white room getting fitted out. We couldn't find a picture of Triple T in any of you in there. But, well, in uh, the... In the and the, again, the closeout crew folks were just uh, um, tremendous professionals about working with us. But at the same time, they they worked with us. I on my first flight, I started a, a little tradition to myself um, because when you go out to fly, the commander gets in first, so the pilot's waiting around for about ten or fifteen minutes. You're about three and a half hours. You go out and get strapped in, and, and so there's two things that I wanted to that I learned to do on my first flight. I wasn't sure, but up at the 195 foot level, um, which is the same level as the white room there mm -hmm. that you go through, um, there's an old kind of a dilapidated, beat up bathroom that's up there at the 195 foot How level. is it? Did it have and, Gunter Vent's name above the. It probably did, and graffiti <laughs> and all stainless steel and nothing that worked right, but um, I was convinced uh, somebody had told me they could, they actually got managed to go to the bathroom before they flew, so I was up for the challenge. And getting out of those orange flight suits uh, isn't a simple task. So I decided, and it worked. And so I decided it takes a little extra time, but then mm -hmm. I decided I, I liked the events because I, I didn't really learn how to go in the diaper, which is an unnatural thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Once you're past two or three A years top old, gun marine not going to go in a diaper. Exactly. We know that. So, okay. And then the second thing is I was waiting. I go out to the access arm just as we're getting ready to walk across the access access arm and there's an old kind of a beat up phone case I opened it up and there was a phone in there that was kind of sooty and a little bit nasty but at the same time I wondered if it worked and it turned out that it worked so I picked it up and and I tried to dial I said okay who do I talk to so I decided I was going to call uh, my daughters at the hotel because they hadn't left yet really and so I tried to call, and as, as you might guess, if, if you know anything about the government bases, that you can't make an outside call. So you, so you have to go. So I called the crew quarters and talked to the crew quarters, and they're like, what? Where are you? I said, I'm at the pad. <laughs> but would you, but I'd, but I'd like you to patch me out into town. So can you give me a landline? Can you patch me out and transfer me this number? Are you sure? You're, yeah, I'm sure, sure, I, sure I want to do this. Uh, well, I don't know if you'll, yeah. I'll, By the way, uh, I'm the commander of this space right. shuttle, right? I'm not asking permission. I said, can you do this for us? So I'm not asking permission. So they did this for me. So I so I called out and got to the hotel room and um, went to talk to my daughters before I flew. And they could really care less. They were watching cartoons and eating cereal. So they didn't really care very much about it. Yeah, Dad, okay, thanks. We like that. Okay, thanks for calling. You know how when you talk to kids and you know they're distracted? Okay, bye. Mm -hmm. So that was it. Um, but I made that tradition each time I went. And and so I guess the story is going to tell about the closeout crew is on my last flight, since the commander is the first one in, we had to build it into the timeline because I told them I was going to take an extra 15 minutes to do these two things that I wanted to do, which I made my little traditions. So the closeout crew was all waiting there and they saw us come up and they said, okay, I'll take your helmet. And I know you're gonna go. Yeah, I know you're gonna go over to the bathroom, and then you're gonna use the phone. And we'll be there waiting for you. I said, okay. That's yeah. cool. Well, ask Travis about that if he remembers that. For sure. Question there for Andy uh, Allen. Brother Matt, uh, did you get Matt. a promotion during one of your flights? Probably didn't happen too often. That's. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Yeah, I did, brother Matt. So, <laughs> yeah, two things. I, I did have a birthday on my first flight. So I had my 37th birthday on my first flight, which was an inflatable birthday cake. And then somebody had brought up some brownies that got all kind of beat up, but they were still good. And then uh, on my second flight, uh, I actually got selected for lieutenant colonel. Hmm. 
So John Casper decided to have a, a ceremony, a promotion ceremony up on orbit. Hmm. So they cut out the drink packs. They cut out a couple drink packs, which are the silver drink packs, and the lieutenant colonel is silver oak leaves. Oh, really? So yeah. Pierre and John cut out oak leaves off of these um, drink packs that we had up there. And we, we did a full ceremony swearing in from on orbit on the second flight. And uh, a couple things happened out of all of that. One of, one of them was uh, the Marine Corps didn't see it the same way we saw it. So as captain of the ship, John Casper thought he had full authority to do a promotion, but the Marine Corps denied it when we got back on the planet. Oh, really? So I had to wait my turn in line. I was looking there my uh, to see uh, my cheat sheet there. Casper's an Air Force guy. Uh -huh. He's a Purdue knot, too, yes. there. Yes. Uh, Nick Enix, our Purdue uh, collection manager over there, Nick, was a Boeing guy and went through Purdue. All those Purdue knots, and, of course, I'm from Ohio, so the Ohio knots. So that but, ceremony uh, made, I guess, made some press. So some people said that uh, it was on uh, quite a few of the talk shows and morning shows. One other thing is, you know, when, Crews are very close, and it's like family when you're with crews. So after we did the ceremony, we all did hugs, and Marsha came up and gave me a big hug and a kiss while we were, she floated up and did it. And and so all this stuff shows up on the on the media. So yeah, we got we got everybody's attention. I guess. That's a lot of fun here with Andy Allen, astronaut. We're talking about his STS-75 mission when he was commander for 16 days of the beautiful spaceship Columbia. From uh, February 22nd to March 9th, that looks like a leap day. You, did you have a February 29th up there built in? Do you remember that? <laughs> I don't remember. Do you remember that? That seems like an even year there. Uh, but this this interesting, there you are walking out to the pad uh, with your crew. Uh, Doc uh, Horowitz was on first of uh, his four flights. Yeah. He was a three-time pilot. And, of course, the great Franklin Chang Diaz, fifth of his seven Record set in seven flights, seven flights with Jerry Ross. And you had three European agencies, uh, astronauts, the two Italians, and um, uh, flying again with Claude uh, Nicolier. Mm -hmm. And Jeffrey Hoffman was on his fifth and last flight. Quite a seasoned crew there you had. We did. We did. And, and Franklin and Claude and myself and Jeff were the were on the original tethered flights, so that, that's how they picked us to fly again. And then they brought up the three rookies, Umberto, Maurizio, and, uh, and, and Doc Scott. Look what I dug up here, Marty. Zoom in on this. This brings back some memories of 23, 24 years ago. A fax. A fax, uh, uh, your official uh, uh, fax something in our archives there. And this fax was sent uh, for an update of the visual charts to support uh, the briefing at the Man Spacecraft Center there, all about the tethered launch. Uh, technology, technology, technology. You, sir, have seen uh, with your aviation and space show, you have seen an incredible leap of technology. And now with, with uh, Aerodyne Industries, uh, address, the, address this 30-year leap of, of just incredible technology. So, again, you know, the, the technology that we have is, it's, it's pretty imaginative in a way because a lot of people can think of things in a way that, that you would normally not think of what you would do things. Mm -hmm. and, and putting dreams to paper is something that, that I think we're the best country in the world that, that does this kind of stuff. Putting dreams to paper, where you can put it. Um, and, and you can see people come up with some ideas and then just turn that into reality. So, again, you know, we're that nation of making the possible and making the impossible possible and, and doing those dreams into reality. And this is the kind of stuff that really shows uh, what we can do that, that nobody else can do. You know, but there's always also always still that, that human piece to a lot of this technology. So I'll tell a, a quick story. I guess I'll digress for a minute on the. Let me talk the human side of that, mm -hmm. that day. That Please day that do. Launched on 75. So a couple things happened on that launch on 75. It was uh, about 3.30 in the afternoon. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. Mm -hmm. um, I was very fortunate because I got strapped in three times and I launched three times. 
But you never two, had a delay, right? Never had a delay. But on two of my flights, we did delay a day, but we delayed prior to tanking, so we mm -hmm. never had to go get strapped in. And so we were going to, we were, it was right after the Daytona 500. Mm -hmm. And so it must have been such a beautiful day. Everybody decided to descend upon Kennedy Space Center to watch a launch. So one of the records we broke that day was how many people came to the visitor center mm. or how many people came to the Kennedy Space Center to watch a launch that day. And I was, I've been told that there was, you know, a couple hundred thousand cars that came down all looking for places to park and see a launch in the middle of the afternoon. Remember I told you earlier about the extended family. So there's a bus that my brothers and sisters and other extended family come up to see the launch mm -hmm. and they pick them up they pick them up uh, down in Cocoa Beach at the hotel bring them up to the launch usually they get there maybe an hour and a half or so prior to launch this day of traffic jams so they changed after our flight they changed all the ingress points where you, you get checks on whether you had passes or not that day because it was so overwhelming but the bus is still on its way in and I'll just tell a story on my, my sister because they weren't sure they were going to make it to the to the Banana Creek in time to see the launch. So my sister, my eldest sister, went up to the astronaut escort. What's her name? Valerie. Valerie. Hey, Valerie. Valerie. Yeah, so Val went up and asked um, the astronaut that was there that was escorting the families if they could call launch control and, and delay the flight, delay the launch. <laughs> because I couldn't go until the family got there. <laughs> okay. Um, so I heard that story uh, a few times. And then the I other- went right to Bob Seek and he says, yeah, okay, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll get, we got a half hour. Uh, we they could... did make it, they made it probably uh, just prior to coming out of the nine minute hole. So they didn't have much time by time. The traffic was just terrible. They got a police escort to get up there. And my brother sent me an email, brother Matt, not brother son Matt. Matthew, but brother Matt, sent me an email later that day that I'd probably been around the earth a few times before the buses ever got back to the hotel because the traffic was just so slow that day. That's something to think about. Yeah, you probably that with 90 crazy. minutes to go around the earth if it took them yeah. two, three hours to get back. That's interesting. We're enjoying a conversation with Andy Allen. We've been talking for an hour and we're about to wrap it up, but we enjoy everybody on <laughs> Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube following us. Please tell your friends to watch the replay of this we've got our facebook lined up so that you can uh, go to different programs throughout uh, this year and a half that marty winkle and i've been co-producing this thing together we wanted to show this shot here there's a beautiful picture of you leading your crew out uh sts 75 taken by tom usiak hello tom in lancaster pennsylvania his his brother mark are great supporters of our museum there and you've probably been in lancaster a couple times I have been. Um, there was a York facility there of barbells back in the day when I used to do. Oh, really? Yeah, near York, Pennsylvania, near Lancaster. Okay. Yeah. And the Amish. Yeah, the Amish, yes. Well, let's get you off the, the ground there and uh, uh, on this beautiful bird. And uh, I picked up something from, uh, uh, there you are in orbit. Uh, one technical thing about a launch that I wanted you to talk about is, I think it's called the thrust bucket. The uh, and Winston Scott talked a little bit about that. That uh, incredibly, the shuttle slows down in a to catch up to the atmosphere or something. Explain the thrust bucket there, Mr. Pilot Commander. <laughs> so, as, so as we're doing our ascent, about a minute and a half or so into the flight, going through about forty, fifty thousand feet. Somewhere around there, and that depending on the atmospheric conditions, but somewhere around there, we are going to have max dynamic pressure on the vehicle. So the pressure of the air hitting the vehicle is going to be at its maximum point, which is what they call max Q. Mm -hmm. So as you're going to go through max Q, you don't want it to exceed a certain level because if it does, it can cause damage to the vehicle, especially on some of the flight control surfaces that we'll want to use later on. So we throttle down as we go through the bucket. So the main engines will come down from 100 104% down to 67% or something like that. And, and you'll feel the, the pullback when you're, when you're riding because on the first stage, there's a lot of vibration. Mm -hmm. And you can actually hear some of the noise, even though the noise is behind us, but the, you can hear the machinery a little bit, even though we have a lot of sound attenuation on. 
we're we're supersonic in the first few seconds uh, when we fly, so we don't really hear the noise that's from the engines per se. We just hear some of the machinery. But we throttle down, and then when we come out of that that max dynamic pressure, that's when you hear the call from from ground control, from launch control. That'll say, you know, throttle up. Mm -hmm. um, from MCC mission control, they'll give us the throttle up. Uh, and and that's almost like a catapult shot when the engines come back up the to full, uh, full power. You really feel it. You, that, really that, feel that, that, you, you feel the Absolutely. slow down, and then you feel the, the thrust do. up there. And I, but uh, is is it anything similar in your your uh, jet uh, aviation to that, or prepare you for that? No, it's it it, it isn't. It isn't. Um, it's power. I, I called it like a catapult shot, where uh -huh. you're going to go from zero to 150 in a second and a half or so off a catapult. But this had more power. You just have you just have such a tremendous feeling of power. A lot of a lot of the power you can't do anything about because it's off the boosters. A lot of vibration off the boosters. And once the boosters come off at the two minute mark or so, then it's a very smooth flight. The main engines are really very smooth. And then you start getting through the throttling, the three G throttling before you get up into orbit. And for the last few thirty seconds or so, it's not very comfortable going through the three G throttling. It's only three Gs, but it's like a six hundred pound gorilla sitting on your oh, chest. Really? And so it gets a little bit labored after a while, and, and, and I always say that the last few seconds is just one of those things you just gut it out because hmm. you're not going to escape it anymore. You're not going to get away from it anymore. You just got to keep laboring your way through it, and then those main engines cut off, and instantaneously you're in zero gravity. The fluid shift in your body starts to happen pretty instantaneously. Hmm. Little dust particles fly around. Sonny Carter lost his watch. That's when his watch started floating around. Um, Did you see any sand in Colombia from the landing out at uh, White Sands? Oh, no, no, I didn't see any of that. Okay, um, they said there was a lot of the there was. mechanic it, said there was still a lot of sand it from took them STS three. Yeah, a long, long time to pick it up. Huh? Yeah, right. Yeah, well, I thank you for sharing right. about that thrust bucket that because that was something that uh, I, was, I was curious about. I know and, you're going to ask me a technical. And question. you really feel yeah, well. Studied. I've been reading a lot of books lately, so okay. on the shuttle, so. Uh, but uh, there you are with your crew in space. Nothing like taking that group shot, I'll bet, uh, to prove uh, that y'all, the, the team has done it and, and uh, yeah, it's ready a, to embark on your, your it's job. It's picture day. And, um, you know, they, they schedule us to work 16 hours um, on our daily agendas. And then you get an eight-hour rest period. If you go longer than 10 days, you get half a day off. Hmm. Uh, but that's... Those are the times we look out the window. Those are the times that we make our little home movie, our crew movie that we make. Um, and then generally after the 10th day, when you're more than 10 days, they'll give you one of your, every day there's a private medical conference that we do. And for the first few days, it's pretty important because a lot of the astronauts are kind of uh, getting used to being in, on orbit and zero gravity. After Politely that, saying a third of them get space sickness, yeah, right? Space Adaptation Syndrome, mm -hmm. SAS, is NASA's fancy name for it. But but then um, after that, the, after the 10th day, they actually let you start having family, uh, you know, some family videos, downlinks and comms so you can talk to your family. So, again, going back to the, the kid stuff, on, on my second flight, I had one. I had it all set up. I had a inflatable globe. I had... M&Ms and goldfish and all kinds of things that I wanted to do. You video downlink, you come uplink, so they, I can hear them, but I can't see them. And so for the 27 minutes of that pass, I think 25 of the 27 minutes was refereeing between two girls fighting each other on who get to ask dad a question. <laughs> well, that's good. That's space. Yes. Uh huh. Is the technology different now? You could only hear, obviously, you know, we have cell phones and stuff. But Jessica's the asking the, the difference in technology oh. of communication. I, I imagine in space, probably. I well, I think the technology is phenomenally different. For those that, that really look at, at all the things that have come out of space exploration, I mean, any exploration program it really is going to be the epitome of technology development. You know, I think when you, when, when you want to take on a task of doing things you never have done before, like take in the 400 years going from Plymouth Rock out to having the United States of America, as you explore, you've got to create technologies 
and be able to support your exploration, whether they be logistics, whether they be medicine, whether they be communications, um, for us, propulsions, anything like that, you got to create technologies that go along with all of that. So mm -hmm. when we get to do something like Apollo go to the moon or do a lot of the experiments we do up in space, which they're doing on the space station now, which we were just kind of playing around with protein crystal growth and human physiology, but now they're really getting to study it where it's long-term and not just something that happens for a few weeks. Um, that's really where you're going to really build up. And we go back to the moon and Mars, that technology development of just what are you going to find is a hard question to answer because you don't know. So you end up saying, well, but for me to get from here to there, I've got to go ahead and create a lot of technologies. At the same time, you have people that are really smart about what to do with those technologies to open up a market or open up an opportunity or make profit, you know, whether it be going from airplanes to airlines mm -hmm. or low earth orbit to Virgin Galactic and SpaceX. Um, there's, there's good innovators that take those technologies that the government does the high risk piece of it and they turn them into something that allows the non-professionals, more the hobbyist, to go up and experience something that a few of us have got to experience. Mark, like that placard we found, spaces in your home. Yes. Yeah, well, since good. you broached the subject there to uh, come to the end of our wonderful program with Andy Allen here, great conversation. We learned so much about not just being an astronaut, but uh, the the type of, of man and, and, and uh, father and and husband that you are. Uh, uh, talk about the private industry. Uh, I, don't, I don't, should I ask you, are they astronauts or not, if they go that suborbital flight? Uh, it's a good question. And so, here, so uh, the way I was thinking about it was there's baseball players and there's baseball players. There's mm -hmm. investors and there's investors. And so astronauts are astronauts. There's some that do it as a profession and there's some that do it as a hobby. You mm -hmm. know, there's different levels. Um, we had an astronaut breakfast recently at a space symposium and one of the the folks that was on the virgin galactic flight with uh, richard branson came to the event you know it was an astronaut's breakfast but she came to the event and, and she got pretty well welcomed and she had good conversations with a lot of good people so there's a there's a difference just like again baseball players there's the professionals that do it as a as a profession that's what they get paid to do that's what they get selected to do not everybody can be on the team and then there's the folks that are going to want the experience and mm -hmm. have the opportunity to get the experience. I, I think what it shows more than anything else on some of that and what I would get excited about is the fact that, that these entrepreneurs, innovators can take the technology that a lot of us have worked hard on and some of us have lost our lives to do mm -hmm. and, and make a business out of it in the in the sense that, well, not only will they make money out of it and turn it into an industry, they can also turn it into an experience, you know, kind of a common experience for mm -hmm. people, just like getting on an airline flight. It used to be the only people that I could ever get on the airlines when the airline business started was very wealthy people. But now, you know, almost anybody can buy a ticket to go on the airlines. I'm not sure you want to fly on the airlines right now, but almost anybody can buy a ticket to mm -hmm. get on the airlines right now. And, and so I think low earth orbit's gonna go there. <clears throat> in, in the Andy Allen, I guess, vision of the world is low Earth orbit will be turned over to industry. Let industry have hotels and and research laboratories. The and, Bezos Hilton, where your grandchildren might be having their uh, uh, great grandchildren's wedding anniversary or that something really like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, you're you're with a business that that is pushing that envelope further mm -hmm. for for all uh, mankind in there uh one thing andy being in a business world i asked him uh, before we started our stay curious program uh was it kind of fun for him to be among business people that didn't know he was an astronaut uh that would be a uh, kind of a fun little card to play sometimes particularly uh in the aerospace industry what about that do you keep low profile <clears throat> i pretty much keep low profile you know, one, because I don't, I don't want to dwell in the past or live in the past. And two is I'm, I'm trying to 
be accepted into a, a new world and a new industry as a business person, not because I was a former mm -hmm. astronaut. But there's been a couple of occasions where we've had fun with it. I, I was at an event where I wasn't saying anything and somebody was doing a lot of bragging about, you know, having an airplane and flying an airplane and, and, um, and we just let him talk and he was just steering the conversation. Uh -huh. And then finally, mm -hmm. um, a person that knew brought up the fact that I had, yeah, Andy, you know, what did you do that? Did you got any flying experience? So, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of went through that for a little while and. That yeah, probably been my my that. wonderful late dad, who was a crazy experimental aviation association guy. He would get into anything that had wings and a uh, oh, a, a prop on it, and uh, we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, well, uh, we were talking about the private uh, blue uh, the uh, the non the suborbital flights of Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, and Marty Winkle, our co-producer here, he suggests we call them Carmonauts. Uh, for, for crossing the Carmen line, and uh, that might be a good distinction. I think a good distinction is whether you orbit the Earth or not. Comment about this billionaire private launch in a week, the Inspiration4 uh, crew flight there. Uh, is this uh, uh, heading in the right direction, or space is still difficult, right, Andy? Space is still difficult, <clears throat> and, and space is sometimes uh, marred with a little bit of of tragedy here and there, and that's the, that's exploration. Um, and so I hope it, none of that happens, and I hope people have a great time. But 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 space is still hard, right? And and space is still a little bit of a frontier that can be a little dangerous, just like it might have been three or four hundred years ago when people were trying to do things. I mean, you you, th you listen to some of the stories about the settlers, and, mm -hmm. and you're just amazed by the the kind of people that would take on those kinds of risks to do the kinds of things that they did. But it's also great in the sense that, that there are people that are out there opening up this world, opening up this industry, opening up this experience to make something that you said earlier, a few hundred of us got to do. Because the, the two things about space that will always be with those of us that have been there. One of them is you never know how your body's really going to react until you go, no matter how much the doctors study you. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is, is you'll never really know the majesty of looking at it. Mm. The universe, not just the earth, but the universe in itself, the galaxy, until you're there, because pictures will never do it justice. So to try to make that a common experience, I mean, I applaud them. I wish them the best of luck. And I think that they'll have a great time when they get to go. I'm a control freak, so I'm kind of nervous if I was up there and I never had any control to do anything. So yeah, that'd be different. For Fly me. by wire, basically, the um, mission is. <clears throat> but there's a lot of smart people that have put it together, and 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 I just wish them all the best. And again, I I think it's exciting to watch this industry being opened up a little bit. So one of these days, that low Earth orbit becomes the place that you can just visit when you feel like visiting. Well, that, that will be amazing for the next generation that we're trying to inspire here at the American Space Museum with stories from people like yourself, Andy Allen, and we appreciate okay. you spending all this time. Do we have any questions? Is there something that I haven't asked you that you would like to share with uh, your whole family out there watching the, our, our uh, Stay Curious program here? Um, no, I think you've done a pretty good job of asking me plenty of questions, Mark. Um, Let's get you down but, to earth here. Where's where's my uh, there? There it is. Uh, but I want to do open up with one thing because because you have because you guys have been great and it, and it's really been enjoyable and and coming into the museum and and seeing all the people that have made contributions to the museum. Um, again, I, I I applaud everybody for all of that, and I really appreciate the fact that uh, people are still trying to explain what it was like and what it is in this program that we used to call the Space Shuttle program. Now we're moving into a different program called Artemis. And now we've got also private industry out there that's doing some stuff. So I think it's great. I, I applaud what you guys are doing. I applaud the mission. Um, you haven't asked me for any contribution, but, I, but I'd like Aerodyne to give you about $3,000. $3,000 uh, yeah, from Aerodyne? Aerodyne? Thank you, Andy. That... Put up our concert. We're going to uh, thank you very much. We'll, uh, hello, Charlie Mars, right? Uh, yeah. the godfather that's got a smile on his face. There. I don't know if my CFO is listening, but if he is, um, he'll know, he'll know now or he'll know <laughs> soon. 
Well, you've seen how hard Karen Conklin, our executive director under our board of directors, led by Charlie Mars, has to uh, keep your legacy alive. It, it is so important that uh, the Apollo legacy that Marty represents, and uh, you are right behind them, your shuttle era. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you'll be 80 years old sometime. Marty's not 80 yet, but uh, you'll be 80 years old sometime, and and you know this is we want a lasting legacy. And for me, as as uh, representing this museum, it 60 years, the space program of America has been proud and brave, and you've been a big part of that. Thank you. And and think of 160 years ago, was the artifacts you're looking at from the Civil War. In 100 years from now, we want them to be be understanding what the tethered satellite system was on 46 and 75 just like we're looking at uh these battles of chancellorsville and stuff like that which marty and i saw not too long ago and, and that's what we're all about and and thank you andy we're going to turn to our skies here uh we have a uh, uh to end our program and and can't thank you enough we're going to get back and say goodbye to you in a second but here is our constellation of contributions ten thousand dollars and counting the last 18 months that we've created uh jessica's created a constellation it was uh karen conklin and my idea to come up with a whole con a zodiac if you will of contributors and we're going to create our own constellations and our first constellation has stars from hazel banks mike mcculley larry osterley's up there john and melinda tribe they're over there uh, Joanne Morgan, that's the Morgan on the bottom. You know Joanne Morgan, uh, well. the, for the, the uh, uh, only woman of a couple hundred men in, of rocket engineers that launched Apollo 11. Uh, Anne Marie and Pete Martino are the double star over there. We've got a double star for Con uh, Karen and Mark Conklin, her husband, our director. Uh, Tom and Mark Usiak, you have your own star up there in the sky. And... Uh, We've been doing this program, and my high school prom queen, Patty, and her husband, Randy Weinkoop, they met each other in, in uh, high school and been married almost 50 years. They contributed money to us to stay curious down the line. You just never know who's, who's watching the show here, uh, Andy. And so there's our stars of our first constellation. Of course, we've got the biggest star is the Marie Louise G. West uh, endowment uh, that has helped us out tremendously pull off this show on three platforms today. And uh, we reveal to you what that constellation looks like. I think we froze. We did freeze. We froze a little bit, but we'll go back to... Are we getting... There There we are. Okay, we froze up there. There's the constellation. We're going to connect the dots, and here's what it looks like. Ready for the reveal? Oh, there... Okay. Uh, we're, yeah. Well, we're, he's going to start the next constellation. This looks like a heart is the shape that we're going for a heart with a a ring around it, and we'll we'll do that again tomorrow on Throwback Thursday up there. But uh, come back to Andy and me here, Mr. Allen. We can't appreciate we can't say how much we appreciate your. Oh, the cameras froze up. Okay. Well, if you're hearing us. You're seeing the constellation. We want to thank everyone again for their support of Stay Curious. A uh, little technical issue going out here, but glad it's at the end. Uh, on behalf of our whole museum here, Andy Allen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're doing our technical. What are you seeing on there, Ellen? Okay. The constellation's up there. Uh, we hope people are hearing us. Uh an hour and a half went by real quick there on your memory lane. Yeah. Uh, Andy, so appreciative of what you've done for the museum. He has pledged $3,000 from our from his uh, corporation. He's the CEO, so he'll be signing that check. And uh, pardon me, oh, we'll start a new constellation with them, I hope. But on behalf of uh, Jessica, Marty, and astronaut Andy Allen, I'm Mark Marquette, and we're looking forward to seeing you in our museum to bridge the space between us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.